Welcome to Economics and Beyond. I'm Rob Johnson, President of the Institute for New Economic Thinking. I'm here today with my friend Justin Lin, who is the Director of the National School for Economic Development in Beijing, and he is the former Chief Economist of the World Bank. Justin has worked in many contexts with INET, but particularly on the questions of development in Africa and the relationship of U.S. and China to that process. We held a meeting together at his headquarters in Beijing in 2018. I found it to be one of the most uh, well-crafted meetings, and learned a great deal in a very short time. So it's a delight to be with you tonight, Justin. Thank you for joining me on the INET podcast. Thank you, Rob, for the nice words about me and my institute. And also well, for your invitation to have this in our conversation. And I'm delighted to do that. And certainly, the concern in the world today is the pandemic, COVID-19. And I think for the COVID-19, it's a reminder that how vulnerable of humanity, no matter how developed we are, but in the face of the nature, we need to be humble. Mm -hmm. And also, it's a reminder that we need to work together because unless we win the victory in every country, in every corner over this pandemic, otherwise, we cannot claim the victory. And I hope that we will work together to help each other and to overcome the current challenges in the developed and the developing wars. Well, I do think that INET is very dedicated to working with you. And I think you underscore many very important challenges, beginning with the pandemic, leading to the US-China relationship, leading to the relationship between these two major countries in development in many regions, and related to the global challenge of climate change. We cannot afford not to cooperate in many of these areas. And so I look forward to your thoughts in, in each case. In the case of the United States relationship with China, what do you see as the dynamic now? What, what is happening? What gives you concern? And what, what do you recommend? Well, the US-China relation certainly is one of the most important concerns in a world like the pandemic, because it's going to affect US, China, and other country of the world. And I like in fighting against the pandemic, regarding the U.S.-China relations, the message is also the same. Because cooperation is essential for the well-being of the people in the U.S., in China, and in the rest of the world. And for the U.S.-China tensions, to me, I was caught by surprise. I received my education in the US and I have been taught that 
development is a human right, and a competition is good, and uh, we need to have fair competitions in the markets. Now facing the challenges in the U.S.-China relations, I find many principles that I learned. I took them into my heart, and I put them into practice. Has been challenges, and I hope we can put politics and the issue aside and come back to the fundamental principles of humanity to respect the right of development in every country and to understand development in one country is not only important for the country it it is also you know bring benefits to every country in the world and we will have the wisdom to overcome the differences and uh, to come back to the basic principle of humanity in dealing with the China-U.S. relations. You've uh, been what you might call a, a principal visionary of what you've come to call new structural economics. And I remember when we met in Beijing in December of 2018, you spoke about things that are, which you might call, uh, quite different than many Western economists focus on. When you're looking at the Chinese development at this stage, or for that matter, when you're looking at the evolution of the United States through the lens of new structural economics, what is it that you see as the major challenges facing each country in these next years? I think that uh, the major challenge is, is that we need to change the reference in our judgment about other countries. In the past, the academics were in the international relations that the developed country or the academics, the theory developed by the academics in the developed country, always use the developed country as a reference to see what the developed countries have and what the developing country do not have, or to look at what the developed countries can do well and uh, the developing country could not do as well as the developed country. And then hope as well as advice the developing country to own what the developed country have and to do like the developed country. I think the intentions are good, but the results often are disappointing. And for the new structural economics, I'd like to change the reference back to the developing country, or back to every country. Allow every country to look at what they have, and based on what they have, what they can do well, and help them to scale up what they can do well. And that is the change in the reference point. And we need to respect every country's the right to do well based on what they have instead of trying to you know, judge or sometimes force 
the other country to own what the developed country have and to do like the developed country. At the end, unless we allow every country to do well, to become prosperities, otherwise we cannot have a peaceful, prosperous, poverty-free world. And uh, this is something I learned from the new structural economics. And uh, I'm convinced by this way, we respect each other and uh, we can have a much better world in the future. And uh, to respect the right of other country, the right of development, and uh, that will bring us a peaceful and a prosperous world in the coming years. And that is good for every country. Because unless we can find a way that to help the underdeveloped countries to become prosperous, otherwise the underdeveloped country, their people will not be happy about their situation. Social political instability will erupt from time to time, and uh, you're going to see the all migrations from the underdeveloped country or community, and uh, that will cause social tensions in the developed part of the world also. And so, you know, the in good intention is not enough. And from the, a few successful countries' experiences, I generate those kind of principles. I find that successful country, they always look at what they have and I try to do based on, do well based on what they have and scale up that. So that is one of the major message from the new structural economics and I hope that will also contribute, you know, to the resolution of the conflict in the world. In the case of U.S. and China cooperation, many people emphasize the powerful dangers associated with the what you might call the specter or the possibility that we will not address climate change adequately. That issue, I sense, is quite important, but I'm interested in your perspective along with climate. Or first, do you agree that that is an important issue for collaboration? And secondly, what other issues would you put at the front of your concern that require U.S. and Chinese collab collaboration and cooperation? Well, certainly climate change is a threat to the humanity again, just like the pandemic. It's real and it will come if we do not take actions now, otherwise, we are going to see the rise of the sea level. We are going to see the extreme weather hitting many parts of the world. And so we should not do business as usual. We should take green actions to, you know, contend it and to, you know, mitigate the danger, and uh, that requires global effort. And as you know, China is committed to that. China is a secretary of the Paris Accord, and China over delivers a commitment according to you know, the international 
agencies' evaluations. So China has every intention to work for that because China understands it's a threat to the world, but it's also a threat to China. And we need to have a global cooperation because it's a global challenges. Unless we work together, otherwise we cannot win the victory, just like the pandemic. And other things like poverty, like hunger, like the 17 you know, sustainable development goals, all that we need to join hands to support each other. And the US now is the most powerful country and uh, we hope US will play its leadership role in bringing together of the effort in the world to fight these global challenges, including the current pandemic, future pandemics, climate changes, hunger, poverty, and then many other challenges in the world. And so at this kind of crucial moment, to have a you know, cooperative, friendly relation between US and China, certainly is the foundation for the cooperation in the world. It uh, has been a source of great concern to me how the American administration has sought to scapegoat or blame China for the pandemic. And I don't myself have a deep understanding of how things have developed but can you describe to me the state of where things are vis-a-vis -vis the pandemic in China currently and also the ramifications for the Chinese economy that have emerged in association with the pandemic? Well, China was caught, caught by surprise about six, six months ago because it first upbroke in Wuhan. At that time, we did not know how deadly, how contagious the COVID-19 was. But luckily, through the effort of the Chinese government, Chinese people, now the pandemic is under control. And the life is returning gradually back to normal. Certainly, we still need to be cautious about the possibility of second outbreak. Because as I said, unless every country, every corner in the world that w wins the victory over the pandemic, we cannot say we have a victory over the pandemic. But by and large, the life in China has returned to normal. And uh, certainly in the first quarters of the year, we see a sharp dip in the economy, but I'm confident the production, the consumption, the business activities will return gradually to normal and we should still have a positive growth rate this year. Do you uh, see, as you observe the United States, things related to the pandemic that you think this country is not handling as well as it could? Yes, I think that, uh, as you say, in the U.S., there's a tendency to use China as a scapegoat for this pandemic. 
but it won't help. Because if you do not try to understand the root of the problem and to use other country as scapegoat, the problem will still be there. And uh, you will not prepare to cope with the problem. And so, as you see, China, you know, was caught by surprise, but China was able to bring that under control. And the U.S., with all the information that made available from China, as well as the health system, the economic powers, but the U.S. has been affected the most serious in the world. So that shows, yes, we have some problems, we have some challenges in the now and in the future. But it's better to face the problems and challenges, to understand the roots, the, pro- the reason, the causes of the problem in an objective, scientific way. And that will help you to find a solution. And to use other country as a scapegoat, it seems to be politically convenient, but you're going to pay a high cost for the ignorance. So that's a lesson that we learn in this, in a blending world of the pandemic. But I think this lesson also apply to other challenges like climate change, or the poverty, or the hunger, or social, other social, economic, or political issues. In the uh, realm of macroeconomic policy, what has China done to try to mitigate or diminish the depressive effects associated with the uh, propagation of the pandemic and the way in which people had to be quarantined or locked down? What kind of response, central bank, fiscal policy, other uh, instruments of policy have been used in China? Uh, Certainly, because the pandemic the lockdowns sharply reduce the demand, causing the you know, unemployment issues, causing the sharp dip in the economic activities. Now things gradually return to normal, and the government need to support. Let's you know, likely recessions and uh, the normal tour as you know the expansionary fiscal policies that the chinese government will issue the special bonds uh, about one trillion yuan to help the local government replenishment of their uh, physical capacity and also, the Chinese government will raise the debt ratio from 2.8% of GDP to 3.6% of the GDP this year. And that will mean another 1 trillion Chinese yuan that allow the government to support some production activities. And the monetary policy wise, the central bank has lowered the reserve ratios and also issue special instrument to increase the credit supply to the business community. Fundamentally, we need to protect the enterprises, especially the small and medium-sized enterprises. They have been hit very seriously in the first quarter of this year. And then to protect the enterprises also means to protect the employment. And, but as I say, things in China now has gradually returned to normal, 
and I think you know the situation will improve. And I just see the World Bank release its forecast for China this year, and the World Bank's forecast China will have one percentage point of growth rate this year, and the world you know is likely to have a negative four plus percentage dip in the growth rate and high income country, you know, some of them will have ten percent reduction in their GDP and or eight percent reduction in their GDP. So overall, the early early return to normal allow Chinese economy to weather through this challenge in a much better way. You uh, both through your work at the World Bank and with regard to new structural economics, have spent a great deal of time focusing on the developments of Africa and the relationship between China and Africa. My friends who are in Africa have said to me that on the one hand, the pandemic makes their people vulnerable because they don't have the well-developed uh, health systems that the advanced countries have created, though those are clearly found to be lacking in many respects, as, as we all now know. But <laughs> in Africa, people looking for a silver lining, looking for some good news, talk about how the younger average age of the, the citizens means that the population may be somewhat less vulnerable than in countries where the population's average age is much older. I don't pretend to have anywhere near your sensitivity or expertise in Africa, but how first, how do you see the pandemic affecting the African continent? And then we'll move on to the next phase of China's relationship with, with Africa. I think uh, so far, all the statistics shows the African country, they weathered through this pandemic much better than other parts of the world. And mm -hmm. one reason, as you said, because their age structure allow them to have a better position to you know, meet the challenges. And also the lesson learned from other country. So although the health system is not as well developed, but the governments there take the precautions and the people there also, you know, take the precautions and hope that the pandemic can be controlled there. But certainly, we need to be careful because, you know, the, as I said, unless we win the victory, every corner of the world, otherwise the danger of outbreak will be there. And hopefully, you know, African country can uh, uh, cope, cope, cope with the challenges and uh, especially, you know, we can have the vaccine soon. And uh, with the vaccines, then we will have the confidence that we can win the victory. And uh, but looking forward, the pandemic will bring in temporary shock and challenges. But there are more long-term challenges in African countries. And so we also need to find a way to help the African country to meet the long-term challenges. The development, the employment, the poverty, and the climate changes. And for that, I think that China, as well as other you know, 
developed communities have the obligation and our moral and our, the moral obligations for helping African country to meet the challenges and uh, to you know achieve the goals promised by SDGs. Well, I I sense from people from the INET community who you met some Camilla Tulm and Folashade Sole that the tension related to climate change in an equatorial region where so many depend upon subsistence farming as a source not only of nourishment and but but also as a as a platform of social stability and with a young demographic where the population is said to be the working age population over the next 40 years as i have read will go from 1.25 billion to 2.6 billion people we have a development strategy now does not easily replicate what Japan, Korea, Taiwan, and China have done based on infant industry protection and the, we might call the engine of manufacturing with automation, global supply chains. It's very hard to see what the next phase will be, though I know there are optimists, some like your countrymen who work at the Luhan Academy, speak as though the ability to integrate markets through electronic in internet infrastructure may create potentials that heretofore were not available as part of a development strategy. But I, I'm curious what you would prescribe for much of the continent of Africa to meet this challenge over the next 40 years with a growing population and what structural ingredients are necessary for them to I would say rise to this challenge and create greater and greater prosperity for their people. I think there's some still a window of opportunity for African countries. As you mentioned, their population is very young, and the job need for the young people is huge. And unless they can find decent job, otherwise they will not be happy. Then the social political stability in their country cannot be maintained. And if there is no social political stability and hope for prosperity in their country, legally or illegally, they will migrate to the developed country in Europe, to the U.S., and causing all kinds of difficulty in adjustment in the recipient countries. And uh, so how to find the decent job for the you know, 1.2 billion young people and 2.6 billion young people, working age people in the future would be mm -hmm. a crucial issue for African country and for the world. And uh, we are talking about the artificial intelligence, AI, we are talking about the robotics, we are talking about the automation that seem to be you know, a threat for jobs. But I think those kind of things may happen in the future. But there are still some years there. Those very liberally intensive manufacturing, the cost for automation is still much higher. Then, you know, employing 
the labor workers to work on that. And I think that there are, you know, from my judgment, there are 15, 20 years of window of opportunity there. And the African country need to capture that opportunities. Otherwise, you know, by the time when those jobs replaced by robots, then unless they have the capital, wealth to employ, to buy robots, otherwise they will have no means to earn their defense. And, uh, and uh, so how to acquire those kind of capital? Then you need to turn your level force into working level force now. They can earn their wages not only for their defense, but they can also save the capitals for the futures. So I think that that's the window opportunity for African country. And it's very important for the global communities to help African country to capture the window opportunities. And China certainly is a member of the global communities. China, you know, on the one hand, uh, 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 you know, will release many of those kind of labor intensive jobs due to the rising of the wages in China. And on the other hand, now China is becoming, you know, the largest economy in the world uh, already by the purchasing power parity and by market exchange rate. I think China will become the largest economy in this decade. And also China will become a high income country. So China needs to share more responsibilities. But I think it's not China alone. We need to work together because if African country can produce those kind of labor intensive goods and they need to have market for that. And also markets are in the developed country in Europe, in the US. And I think we need to work together to help African countries and helping other country, African countries means helping ourselves. Uh, 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 so hopefully that this, you know, not just a uh, hope and it will be a reality. And how to make that become a reality. As I said, in the past, we always use the developed country as a reference of the developed country, you know, what developed country owned, what developed country can do well, will be duplicated in a developing country. And the intentions certainly was good, but the result was poor. And we need to change the reference. We should look at what African country have now. And as you mentioned, they have a lot of young labor. And what they can do well, Certainly, that will be labor intensive industries. So, we should help them to scale up what they can do well uh, uh, on those kind of labor intensive industries. If they can scale up those kind of industries, they can create a lot of jobs and allow the young people to have decent earnings. And they can also save and uh, they can increase their capitals. So, those days that everything can be replaced by robots, they will have the means to employ those kind of robots and they can enjoy the same prosperity as we have. So I'm delighted to have this opportunity to have this conversation, but I have been late for another commitment. Well, then I think we should uh, bring things to a close. But I, uh, I guess my last question to you would have been, has China's development strategy vis-a-vis -vis Africa changed as a result of the pandemic? Or is it on course with the kind of policies, goals, and collaborations that you uh, and I discussed as, as recently as December of 2018? I, well, as you know, that China has a reputation for sticking to the basic principles. Mm -hmm. And once the basic principle is adopted, China will not change that. 
just like China proposed the peaceful co coexistence. Uh, 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 five principles for that uh, in the 1960s, and China has been, you know, uphold those kind of principles. And so similarly, in terms of China, US, uh, China, African, you know, cooperation, the basic principle will not change. China still commit to that. And certainly, the priority may adjust a little bit. Currently, every country is fighting against COVID-19, and China certainly devote more effort to support African country to cope with the COVID-19, but China still committed to help African country uh, to join hand with African country to you know develop in African country and that will be good for African country and that will also be good for China and for the rest of the world. Okay, well, thank you. Justin, it's always nice to hear your thoughts and it certainly helps us to understand both China, Africa, and the challenges that the world faces. I hope that in a few months' time, perhaps after the U.S. presidential election, mm -hmm. I can call you again and we can do another chapter for this podcast. But for now, I want to thank you for being our guest tonight and for sharing all of your insights with our audience. Thank you very much, Rob, and looking forward to our next podcast. I agree. I look forward to it as well. So thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Good night. I look forward to it as well. And check out more from the Institute for New Economic Thinking at ineteconomics.org.